to... Wow, what a difference a couple of months makes. Just a few months ago, it would have looked like that Rocket Lab's Too Many Toes mission was simply too many failures. This brought them under the 90% success mark, which can be the kiss of death for many launch providers. It looked like after losing a couple of satellites from their most high profile customer, that Rocket Lab was in danger of losing customers to what might have been perceived as more reliable competitors, such as Virgin Orbit, which had a very highly publicized and successful launch of Space Force and other satellites not that long after this failure. On a side note, those nine Rutherford engines actually have less thrust than New Shepard, but man, they sure sound a hell of a lot more impressive, don't they? But in any event, not that long afterwards, after an in-depth and detailed investigation of this failure, Rocket Lab was able to track down the elusive problem, something that probably would have taken Boeing 15 years to accomplish, and successfully launched a very high-profile mission for the U.S. Space Force. And in that moment, Peter Beck and his scrappy little New Zealand company, and I don't give a damn where they're based out of, this is a New Zealand company. They launch from New Zealand. The people doing the countdowns are New Zealanders. Most of the innovation and the engineering are out of New Zealand. I mean, come on. This place is based out of US simply for convenience sake only. This is a company that came from New Zealand Zealand, and they should be proud of it. Its headquarters is simply irrelevant. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. But after this successful launch, Rocket Lab has now tied down a bunch of high profile customers, including Black Sky, which was the operation that they lost those satellites for. So clearly, in spite of the fact that the small sat market is becoming increasingly saturated, in spite of the fact that there are emerging competitors that can put up heavier payloads to more difficult orbits than the Electron can, the experience that Rocket Lab has and their reputation is carrying them to a lot of successful contracts that is going to keep them going until the Neutron emerges. And I'm going to tell you a lot more about who these customers are and one in particular that is embracing bleeding edge technology that could make a massive difference for man's future in space. And we're going to get started on that in just a few moments. So the format is a little bit different this time. I'm going to reserve my in-person comments for the end of the video and see how things work out. And just bear with me and I won't talk about that anymore. Let's move on. So after the U.S. Space Force mission in July 29th, the customers started lining up again. Now. Rocket Lab already had an established contract with NASA, which has now been moved to New Zealand as of August 6, 2021. And this is, of course, the capstone mission, which is intrinsically important to the future of Artemis. 
Capstone is probably the least expensive aspect of Artemis, and yet one of the most important projects at least over the next couple of years, and it really pisses me off that this mission doesn't get more attention, because it is absolutely essential. What the Capstone mission is supposed to do is insert a small sat into cislunar space into a rectilinear halo orbit. We have never attempted an orbit like this before, and it's extremely important to the future of Artemis that it succeed, because it not only provides non-stop communication to the Gateway, there'll be no blackouts as there were with the Apollo missions, but on top of that it provides access to the entire lunar surface. A slight adjustment in the trajectory of Lunar Gateway can provide access to a different part of the lunar surface surface far more easily than previous missions have, simply because of the pole-to-pole -pole nature of the orbit. The satellite will be delivered to cislunar space by the Rocket Lab Photon spacecraft. Not a kick stage or an upper stage or anything like that, but a spacecraft unto itself, designed to carry small sats to specific orbits or even on moon journeys to the moon or interplanetary journeys. This revolutionary new spacecraft is what makes Capstone possible and also is going to allow Rocket Lab to send a highly publicized mission to Venus by 2023. Not only that, it's helped them secure a lot of new customers, including the one that I'm hiding from you right now, but I'll be revealing in just a few minutes. On August 11th, the Photon also helped Rocket Lab secure three consecutive space missions at least for a company called Varda Space Industries, which is experimenting with space manufacturing. Things like superconductors and high-tech fiber optics and 3D printing, things that can only be done in microgravity. In spite of the fact that this company was started by former SpaceX employees and originally they had announced that they were going to be going up on a rideshare mission probably on a Falcon 9. The Rocket Lab timetable and their ability to transport a customer to an orbit of their choice on their timetable for an affordable price is what helped them secure this very high profile customer. And in spite of losing a couple of very important satellites for Black Sky in the Too Many Toes mission, Black Sky has contracted Rocket Lab again for three back-to-back -back missions. And in case you're wondering who Black Sky is, well, they're kind of a combination of Big Brother and Skynet. Okay, that's a little dark, but really they provide extremely detailed information about what's going Going on on the surface of the planet at any given moment from terms of environment, disasters, population movement, all sorts of information that's managed by primitive artificial intelligence and provided to their customers. This can affect stock prices, this can affect business plans, this can affect reaction to disaster scenarios on the part of governmental agencies. This company provides extremely detailed information, keeping a close eye on everything happening, including what you and I do, and providing this information to their clients in order to assist what they do in their day-to-day -day work. Now, if this makes you a little uneasy, I don't blame you, but at the same time, Black Sky is providing a very critical service for the human civilization, and they should be applauded for that, and Rocket Lab still has them as probably their most important customer. And finally, here they come, who I believe is arguably the most important new customer that Rocket Lab has. And they're going to seem very underwhelming to begin with, but they're called Aurora Propulsion Technologies. And they're out of Finland, of all places, and they have decided to attack one of the most significant problems spacing, facing rather space flight in the future, and that, of course, is space 
space junk, and they're doing it with a whole fleet of unique vehicles that I think are going to be able to tackle the job very effectively. Let's have a look at these things. They're small, but they can do the job quite impressively. Now the first of these is the Arm O, and it is tiny, three by three by five centimeters. It is an utterly tiny little satellite, but it can grab a hold of a piece of space junk that weighs as much as 10 kilograms and deorbit it. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind that 80% of the space junk up there that represents a significant threat is in about this size range. And then you've got the Arm E that's little more than a thruster pack add-on for the Arm O and other satellites that they have in their family and it's a hot gas propulsion system that allows the satellite to carry out multiple missions removing quite a bit of space junk from low earth orbit before their mission is completed and they deorbit themselves. And then you've got the Arm A that's capable of removing slightly larger satellites, perhaps as large as 20 to 25 kilograms, still small stuff, but keep in mind the vast majority of what represents a problem in orbit is the tiny stuff. Larger satellites can be avoided by the ISS and even other active satellites without risk of collision. It's the small stuff that represents the most frequent problem and these things can be deployed in vast numbers because they are so small. And in addition, they have a product called a Plasma Tether. It's designed to fire a micro-thin tether as far as half a kilometer away from the satellite to grab a hold of a piece of space junk and slow it down with what's called Kalum Drag. And put in its simplest terms, it just uses an electrostatic field to reduce the speed of a metallic object and get it under control so it can be deorbited. Now these things may seem very small, but actually this tether can remove a satellite that weighs as much as a metric ton if it's attached to the correct satellite to be used for that task. But as far as this company is concerned, they want to remove all the small stuff and they can do it too. A single photon spacecraft could deploy as many as 200 of these satellites. Now the very notion that a Finnish company and a New Zealand rocket company is embracing and taking on the problem of space junk, whereas the big countries in the world are essentially ignoring the problem, is reprehensible. Everybody should be embracing this sort of thing right now given the threat that this represents to space flight, but it's left to the Finns and the New Zealanders to tackle the problem and it looks like they're going to do a damn good job of it. But wait a minute, you say, you, you clickbaiter, you, what about this thing that can travel all the way to Saturn in a year? When are you going to talk about that? Well, this very same Finnish company is embracing this problem as well with something called an electric sail. Now you've heard of light sails, but what this does is uses the same kind of tendrils similar to the tethers that they're using to remove space junk and then charging it with an electromagnetic charge. And this particular field, sort of an artificial magnetic field, is bombarded by the protons from the solar solar wind. Now this is not a lot of acceleration, but in the space of a few months, this creates a type of ship and a type of propulsion that can travel as fast as 10 to 20 astronomical units per year. And Saturn is only 10 astronomical units away from the sun. So no, I wasn't clickbaiting you. And this is a technology that can actually move even faster than that. It's simply unbelievable.
And unlike light sails, electric sails continue to maintain acceleration and their energy from the sun a far greater distance than light. The protons from the solar wind keep going all the way out to the heliosphere. So we're talking about something that might be able to reach the heliosphere in less than 10 years, as opposed to the Voyager, which was hardly slow and took almost four decades to go the same distance. So what we're talking about here is a technology that will allow small sat probes to go all the way out to the outer solar system without having to wait for other planets for gravity assist within the space of about a year or less than a year if we're talking about Jupiter. This would revolutionize our exploration of the outer solar system. Now, we're talking 150 kilometers per second, over a half a million kilometers per hour, or fast enough to go from Earth to the moon in 43 minutes. Now we do have a probe, the Parker Solar Probe, that achieved similar speeds when it got the closest to the sun that it was designed to go, but that was utilizing the gravitational pull of a star to accelerate, something that's kinda hard to come by. Whereas this system can achieve similar speeds without using anything except its own propulsion and of course the solar wind. Now is this something that could be scaled up? Could we use it for human transport? Well, the answer is a qualified yes. In the description, I have an article that describes a futuristic system that would use a massive proton particle beam powered by a megastructure, although nowhere near as big as some of the megastructures that would be required to accelerate light sails, and it would fire these protons at relativistic speeds into an artificial magnetic field generated by a larger ship, and you could do that with the starship extend the tendrils out from the starship to a distance of, well, pretty big. We're talking 20 to 30 kilometers, but the tethers themselves would actually be quite small and accelerate the vessel to its target. Now, of course, you would also need a particle beam at the other end of the equation to decelerate it. So this is something that would probably be pretty useful to travel around the solar system at extremely high speeds but interstellar travel would be a little bit more problematic. You might be able to achieve speeds of about 20% of the speed of light, although slowing down might be possible utilizing the solar wind of the star that you're traveling to, assuming that you started decelerating years ahead of time. Difficult, but not impossible. Interstellar travel looks more and more plausible the more we learn. But nevertheless, the fact that we have a little Finnish company and a New Zealander rocket company exploring this kind of breakthrough technology to clean up a problem that represents a serious threat to our civilization and our species in the future, and even to transport us to the edge of the solar system and perhaps beyond. The fact that these two companies are going to start exploring this before anybody else is something to be admired. So, like with any kind of technology, there is a catch to this sort of thing. Since our Earth has a magnetosphere, the solar wind does not penetrate sufficiently in order for this thing to even pick up any sort of speed, so it would require a chemical rocket to get it beyond the Earth's magnetosphere out to the moon or something like that before it would start accelerating with the solar wind. That's one drawback. Another drawback back as it would require an electron gun to bleed off the electrons that also come with the solar wind because the positive protons and negative electrons would sort of cancel each other out, the electrons decelerating the sail. So there are complications obviously with this technology, but at the same time, that is what these guys are intending to do something about. The whole notion that, you know, a startup in Finland 
and still a relatively small company out of New Zealand is embracing and going after this kind of breakthrough technology and plus cleaning up all the space junk. I mean, it is amazing. It is astonishing and it really pisses me off because the companies or rather the countries that have GDPs in the trillions of dollars that could do so much more about this issue are doing so much less. And they're the ones who created the damn problem in the first place. I mean, it just annoys the hell out of me. And these countries need to start plowing some investment into this sort of technology, help these companies out if their technology proves to be effective, give them lucrative contracts, and set them to work in cleaning up these problems and also to provide a far more efficient and rapid transit capability throughout the solar system. Yes, I mean, decelerating would be a serious problem. Aero braking at those kinds of speeds, I think you would need some sort of breakthrough technology in the way of heat shields in order to decelerate, especially at a place like Mars, perhaps not Jupiter because it has such a massive atmosphere, but still at those kinds of speeds, I think even the best heat shields would just melt away. Still, I would think that, you know, these sorts of things could be overcome. Achieving these kinds of velocities would make the solar system available to the human species. And as I said, you know, we're talking about just magnetically charged or electrostatically charged tendrils extending out from any kind of ship that you'd want. You could have the starship and the tendrils extending out, perhaps a nuclear power plant to generate the electrostatic field if solar power didn't do the job. There's so many different ways to take advantage of this type of technology. And of course, the promise of interstellar travel is also there. You know, there's so many different ways that you can travel interstellar, almost all of them, in my opinion, involving the use of a transportation method that has no fuel. In other words, you know, powerful lasers or powerful radio beams or, or powerful particle accelerators, something along those lines, in order to get ships up to relativistic speeds. And this whole concept concept of the electrostatic sail or electric sail, it would actually be able to decelerate coming into another star because there is a solar wind of sorts or interstellar wind between the stars. So it's if it started decelerating years ahead of time before it even arrived within the heliosphere of the other star, it could theoretically slow down enough in order to be able to explore another star system. Granted, we're talking about huge amounts of time here, decades and decades, depending on what your destination is, but it makes it possible. And actually, there is increasing astronomical evidence that somebody is using technology like this already. Although, of course, this is hotly debated, but not as much as you're going to see with an upcoming episode that I have about Project Galileo, which is focused on the whole objective of finding evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations using good old astronomy astronomy and led by Dr. Loeb. Yes, indeed, that is something that's getting real funding now, probably because of all of the information that we have gathered on UFOs as of late and the fact that this thing is finally starting to be taken seriously. But that's for a future episode. Uh, if you like what I'm doing, it's all in the description. I could certainly use some more Patreon support, but at the same time, time, you know, a like and a subscribe would be very well received. And don't forget the sweepstakes. Yeah, you must be a subscriber. Uh, Patreon supporters get a little extra, but it's all linked in the description as well to get some free uh, merchandise from the Angry Astronaut and also from Axiom Space.
space. So until the rest of the planet, Roscosmos, NASA, the ESA, start to do something about these sorts of technologies that right now are being embraced by the humblest of companies until other major organizations start recognizing that the way they're doing things is antiquated and is never going to allow us to colonize the solar system and we need to find other solutions while we're cleaning up our damn orbital space, by the way. Until that moment comes, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.